King Charles III is officially proclaimed as the new monarch in a ceremony at St James's Palace, televised for the first time. In a ritual stretching back centuries, the king pledged his commitment to his new role in front of a packed room. And in carrying out the heavy task that has been laid upon me, and to which I now dedicate what remains to me of my life, I pray for the guidance and help of Almighty God. All six living former prime ministers were in the audience, which included other senior politicians, judges and officials. Outside, hundreds of people witnessed the pomp and ceremony of the proclamation up on a balcony of the palace. Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. A surprise show of unity as the Prince and Princess of Wales are joined by Prince Harry and Meghan at Windsor Castle. And at Balmoral, the Queen's three younger children and their families viewed tributes to her after attending a church service. It comes as the date of the Queen's funeral is announced as Monday the 19th of September. And in other news this evening... Ukraine says it's retaken several key towns and cities in the north and east as its offensive against Russian forces gathers pace. Good evening. Charles III, who became monarch immediately after the death of his mother, has been formally proclaimed king at St James's Palace in London. In a ceremony which dates back centuries and which was televised for the first time in its history, the death of Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II was officially confirmed before the new monarch swore an oath. King Charles paid tribute to his late mother, saying her reign had been unequalled in dedication, duration and devotion. He vowed to follow her example and to seek peace, harmony and the prosperity of all the nations where he is now head of state. He also confirmed that the date of the Queen's funeral, Monday the 19th of September, will be a bank holiday across the country. Our Royal Correspondent Nicholas Witchell was watching today's events. In the setting of London's original Royal Palace at St James's, the Accession Council. Britain's political leaders, past and present, with other notable figures, there to pledge their allegiance to Britain's new head of state. God save the king. God save the king. The king joined the accession council gathered in the palace's throne room to make his declaration. It is my most sorrowful duty to announce to you the death of my beloved mother, the queen. I know how deeply you, the entire nation, and I think I may say the whole world, sympathise with me in the irreparable loss we've all suffered. My mother's reign was unequalled in its duration, its dedication and its devotion. Even as we grieve, we give thanks for this most faithful life. I am deeply aware of this great inheritance and of the duties and heavy responsibilities of sovereignty which have now passed to me. In taking up these responsibilities, I shall strive to follow the inspiring example I have been set in upholding constitutional government and to seek the peace, harmony and prosperity of the peoples of these islands and of the Commonwealth realms and territories throughout the world. And in carrying out the heavy task that has been laid upon me and to which I now dedicate what remains to me of my life, I pray for the guidance and help of Almighty God.
concerning the security of the Church of Scotland. The King took a centuries-old oath to preserve the position of the Church of Scotland. I, Charles III, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland, and of my other realms and territories, King, Defender of the Faith, do faithfully promise and swear that I shall inviolably maintain and preserve the settlement of the true Protestant religion as established by the laws made in Scotland. Watched by the heir to the throne, Prince William, Prince of Wales, and Camilla the Queen Consort, he signed the oath Charles R. Charles Rex, King. And then a moment of pageantry. From a balcony, the Garter King of Arms issued the proclamation of the new king's reign. Whereas it has pleased Almighty God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lady, Queen Elizabeth II, of blessed and glorious memory, by whose decease the crown of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland is solely and rightfully come to the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George. We, therefore, do now hereby, with one voice and consent of tongue and heart, publish and proclaim that the Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign of happy memory, become our only lawful and rightful liege lord, Charles III. The King's Guard gave three cheers. Three cheers for His Majesty the King. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. Hip, hip. Hooray. Following centuries-old tradition, the proclamation was also issued in the City of London. Hooray! Hip, hip! Affirming and proclaiming the reign of Charles III to all corners of his kingdom. Nicholas Witchell, BBC News. The new Prince and Princess of Wales and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex have appeared together in a surprise show of unity this evening. They greeted well-wishers and looked at floral tributes outside Windsor Castle. Prince William also issued a statement paying tribute to the late Queen. Daniela Ralph reports now on the brothers' joint visit. Nobody had seen this coming. After the fallout and friction, it was unexpected and unannounced. Walking together through the Cambridge gates of Windsor Castle, the new Prince and Princess of Wales and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. It was a family reunited in grief. There were a few words exchanged as they looked at the flowers and tributes left to honour the Queen. All eyes were on them. The brothers have barely spoken to each other in two years. But today, something clearly shifted. Then to the crowds. Harry and Meghan down one side of Windsor's long walk, chatting, receiving flowers and condolences. On the other side were William and Catherine, doing much the same, particularly with families and children who'd come out to remember the Queen. It's lovely to come together, isn't it, for their nan? They both obviously love their nan very much, don't they? Time of crisis, we all need to be together. Obviously no family likes you know, any conflict, don't fall out. No, well, obviously, we don't know what's going on, but it's great to see them together. And obviously, as well, it's good for the country as a whole. Earlier, William, Prince of Wales, issued a moving, personal statement about his grandmother. He said, She was by my side at my happiest moments, and she was by my side during the saddest days of my life. I knew this day would come, but it will be some time before the reality of life without Granny will truly feel real. The fractured relationship between William and Harry has shown few signs of healing. After the funeral of their grandfather, the Duke of Edinburgh, there was hope that this chat would lead to a reconciliation. There was a similar hope when the brothers came together to unveil a statue of their mother. But the hurt was deep on both sides and neither could find a peace. 
Today was an extraordinary moment of solidarity, perhaps driven by the public outpouring of love for their grandmother and the weight of responsibility their father now bears. As they walked back, there was a joint goodbye. Bye, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. And then the royal couples left together in the same car. Who knows if this is a lasting reconciliation. But today, the loss of the Queen has gone some way to mending a damaging family rift. Daniela Ralph, BBC News. Let's go live to Windsor now and to our correspondent, Dan Johnson. And Dan, you were there when the princes arrived. What was the atmosphere like? Oh, absolutely electric. You could feel the excitement rippling through the crowd. People had heard a rumour that they might get a view of some of the royals today. I think they were really pleased to see the new Prince and Princess of Wales. Really glad that they got that chance to see them and to share some thoughts to show their respects, but really pleasantly surprised to also see Harry and Meghan and this show of unity that the family was able to put on, that they were able to put aside their differences, the division that has existed between the brothers uh, over the last few years. And it's been really well received by people here. I think they really appreciated the chance to hand over some flowers, to share a few words, to give a message of condolence. And Prince, Prince William was overheard saying that some of the kindest, warmest messages that he's received have been from the youngest people and this has felt like a unified family occasion especially today because there have been so many children in the thousands that made up the crowds here today. I've seen grandparents trying to explain to grandchildren what a momentous occasion this is, sharing their own memories of the Queen and what she meant for them and it seems that she's been able not just to unify families here in the crowd but hopefully do something to unify her own family and it was clear that the royals took great strength that they enjoyed the time they spent here about 45 minutes that they were shaking hands and talking to people in the crowd and i think they took strength from that and the people who gathered here through the day to lay these flowers to pay those tributes were really pleased uh, to see them and that's been really well received dan many thanks Meanwhile, all day, crowds have continued to gather outside Buckingham Palace and St James's Palace to pay their respects to the late Queen. Our special correspondent, Lucy Manning, has been spending the day with those who've travelled to pay tribute. The King and his people determined to forge a connection, to create a bond. For the second day, King Charles came out from behind palace walls. This is the public getting to know his majesty and the monarch making his first steps as King Charles rather than Prince Charles to meet them. Very overwhelming, yeah, absolutely. I've waited my whole life for that moment. I just love him, he's great. I just shook the new king. <laughs> what do you think he's going to be like as a monarch? I think he's going to be fantastic. You know, he's had some fantastic training from, from the mother, the queen. This morning, if there was ever a moment for a child to live through history, to understand kings and queens, to mark the moment one era transitioned into another, this was it. Just a few hundred from the crowds of thousands allowed outside St James's Palace to hear the new king proclaimed. The youngest, Orla Elizabeth, 11 weeks old. It's history, isn't it? And I think by bringing her down today, it's something that we can talk to her about. She'll obviously be spoken to about the Queen because she's named after her. And then it's something that she can then pass on to her kids. So what do you make of King Charles so far? I think he's been absolutely uh, incredible, really. And doing all of that, what he did yesterday, um, the, you know, the day after his mother died, um, it takes gut. Um, and I thought he was absolutely magnificent. A real sense of trying to involve the people, his subjects, to bring them along with the change. Knitted by their grandma, Lottie and Isabel had brought their queens. Why have you brought those down today, girls? Um, because King Charles... 
We went to put flowers down for the Queen. It's a moment of history. We wanted the girls to come and pay their respects and uh, see the new King. It will be a changing era, but I think the public are behind Charles and King Charles, and uh, it will support him all the way. Not everyone had the best view, but we are all living through, experiencing this new era. Thankfully today I'm not crying because yesterday I was crying very much. So, What did you make of the proclamation ceremony? I mean, like, it, it's emotional. I, oh, my God, Prince Charles is a king and the Queen is not there anymore. Uh, Buckingham Palace was enveloped by people, mournful, celebratory, a swirl of changing emotions. The royal car slowing so that everyone here could say they'd seen King Charles. It was worth the wait. Brilliant. How long did you wait for? I think we've been about three hours. <laughs> so, and Why did you want to come now? Uh, I just wanted to be part of this. Uh, just so important, just to be part of the moment. And what do you make of the new king? He's, I like him. I like Charlie. He's good. Yeah, I, I really like Charlie. A pilgrimage to the palace. Flowers to remember the queen. Cheers to welcome the king. Lucy Manning, BBC News. King Charles met senior politicians in London today from the government and from opposition parties. Members of Parliament have been swearing allegiance to him as the new head of state and have also been paying tributes to Queen Elizabeth. From Westminster, our political editor Chris Mason reports. Carved into the very stones of Parliament, a king passed as a new one ascends. I swear by Almighty God. MPs didn't have to make a new pledge today, but those that did could choose its precise form. According to law, so help me God. I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to His Majesty King Charles, his heirs and successors, according to law. And even its language. Delivered here in Welsh. What we are witnessing, florid in decoration, freighted with history, the British Constitution, the relationship between Parliament, Government, Monarch, exposed to global sunlight like never before. This afternoon, the new King, the new Prime Minister and her Cabinet, an audience at the Palace, a relaxed tone. A former Prime Minister has told the BBC the King has been preparing for this moment. I uh, had audiences with Prince Charles when Queen Elizabeth II was still on the throne because he wanted to start thinking about how to conduct those audiences. And from what I saw, he, he will be brilliant at that job, brilliant at listening, brilliant at asking questions, um, giving wise advice and sage counsel. I mean, this has probably been the longest apprenticeship in history. Opposition party leaders, Your Majesty. The King has also been meeting other senior politicians. Your Majesty. Including Labour's Sakia Starmer, who offered praise. I thought his speech yesterday was fantastic, by the way. Who did you? Oh, it was encouraging. It was if you <laughs> so reassuring. Yeah, it was I think it's really far too long. Really. Next in line, the leader of the Liberal Democrats, Sir Ed Davey, hoping to discuss green themes. I'd love to talk to you about some issues on the environment and mm -hmm. climate change in due course, but can I first of all offer my sincere condolences? Thank you very much. Thank you. And then the leader of the Scottish National Party at Westminster, Ian Blackford, reflecting on the Queen's final days in Scotland. You know how much she loved being in I know, well, well that's the point. Yeah. You see, so it was rather wonderful to yeah. it from that point of view. Yeah, she's at peace. Well, exactly. she's at peace. A woman of very strong faith, mm -hmm. and we are too. So. <laughs> In the coming days, the King will head to Edinburgh, Cardiff and Belfast. The Prime Minister will accompany him. The magnitude of these moments isn't lost on any of those caught up in them. And we can speak to Chris at Westminster now. Chris, on that final point you made, the fact that the new Prime Minister will be accompanying the new King, what do you make of that? Well, a new head of state and a new head of government introducing themselves to the country in their new roles for the same time and at the same time. Now, I'm told the 
Prime Minister's role in the coming days will be to attend church services in each of the cities where the King stops. And so in that sense, her role won't be hugely prominent. But I'm struck that at a time where there are strains in the architecture of the UK, those who are arguing that they should go their own way, it is a vivid illustration for the Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland to embark on this trip so early in her tenure. And that unquestionably, I would say, is useful politically. But before those moments, uh, another big moment here at Westminster on Monday when the King will head here to address MPs and peers uh, in Westminster Hall. Another moment which will be quite a moment. Chris, many thanks. Chris Mason there. And there is more on that interview with David Cameron and that's on Sunday with Laura Kunzberg tomorrow morning at nine on BBC One. As you heard earlier, it's been announced that the Queen's State funeral will take place on the morning of Monday the 19th of September at Westminster Abbey. The Queen's cortege will leave Balmoral tomorrow and head to Edinburgh. Our correspondent James Landale has the details. It is here in the ballroom at Balmoral Castle that the Queen now rests, her oak coffin covered with the Royal Standard for Scotland and a wreath of flowers, the estate staff paying their last respects. Tomorrow morning, six of the Queen's gamekeepers will carry the coffin to a hearse that will drive slowly south, taking six hours to reach the Palace of Holyrood House in Edinburgh. The following afternoon, just after half past two, the coffin will travel in military procession along the Royal Mile to St Giles Cathedral, with the King and other members of the Royal Family following on foot. There, after a service involving people from all parts of Scottish society, the Queen's body will lie in rest for 24 hours to allow the public to pay their respects. There'll be a continuous vigil held by the Royal Company of Archers and, just after 7pm, by the King himself. On Tuesday afternoon, the coffin, accompanied by the Princess Royal, will be flown to Northolt Airport in London and taken on to Buckingham Palace. From there, on Wednesday afternoon, the Queen's coffin will leave the palace, conveyed up the mall by a gun carriage, the King and members of the royal family walking slowly and silently behind, with no music, just the tolling of Big Ben. Through horse guards, down Whitehall, the procession will end at Westminster Hall, where the Archbishop of Canterbury will conduct a short service. In this ancient building, the Queen will lie in state for four full days, her coffin mounted on a raised platform known as a catafalque, with many thousands expected to file past the coffin. And then, on Bank Holiday Monday morning, the Queen's coffin will leave Westminster Hall and be taken in a grand military procession to Westminster Abbey. Members of the royal family are expected again to follow on foot. At 11 o'clock, the full state funeral will begin at the Abbey, where foreign statesmen, European royal families and other dignitaries will join the public in honouring the life of a Queen who will be laid to rest later at St George's Chapel, Windsor. James Landale, BBC News. Well, joining me now is our royal correspondent, Daniela Ralph. And Daniela, it's been a day of emotion and also tradition, but the big surprise was at Windsor. Yeah, that was extraordinary and, as you say, surprising to see Harry and Meghan uh, out and about today. We now know that it was William, Prince of Wales, who reached out to the Duke and Duchess of Sussex this afternoon and asked if they wanted to join him and his wife meeting the crowds and viewing the tributes in Windsor. Uh, a palace source this evening has said that William felt that at this time of deep national mourning, he wanted to show a family unity and that was pretty much what we got. I thought there were times when perhaps the couples looked a little ill at ease, Meghan perhaps a bit nervous, but the reaction from the crowd was warm and welcoming to them all. So a very warm reaction. I think there was genuine delight as well at seeing this particular group back together. But what we don't know at the moment is whether this is going to lead to any kind of lasting fix to this broken relationship. And are there any signs yet of how the reign of King Charles might differ from that of his mother? Yeah, I think there are some subtle signs, just a, a couple of days in of a, of a, different, a different approach. Um, I think King Charles will obviously want to honour the memory of his mother, and we know that he has 
deep respect for the role of constitutional monarch. But I think in what we've seen him say and do over the past couple of days, he's been more open, more personal, more emotional, more revealing. If you think yesterday when he arrived at Buckingham Palace, he didn't go in first, he stopped, he talked to people outside, met the crowds. The same again today, direct contact with people. And I think there are signs there is just going to be a subtle difference in style and approach from King Charles III. Thank you very much. Daniela Ralph. The Queen's three younger children, Princess Anne and the Princes Andrew and Edward, along with their families, remain at Balmoral. And today, after a church service, they took time to read and admire the growing number of floral tributes outside the castle's gates. From there, Sarah Campbell reports. It's not long now until the late Queen leaves this beautiful part of Scotland forever a place which was so close to her heart. Before she starts her final journey tomorrow, people travelled here to say their own goodbyes. The Queen's family was on the minds of many of those here today, and this afternoon the castle gates opened and in convoy three of the Queen's children, Prince Andrew, Prince Edward, Princess Anne and their families made their way to the local church for a private service. During her lifetime, the Queen talked about the strength and comfort she found through her faith. And during the long summer months here on the Balmoral Estate, she worshipped here at Crathy Kirk. In its familiar surroundings, her family came together today to pray. It was a short service, and afterwards, the three families left the vehicles and walked across the bridge over the River Dee to the people who had come to pay their respects. This is a family event and I just feel incredibly solemn for that. They've got such a solemn time ahead of them as a family. It's important that he's aware because, of course, he'll only know really a king rather than a queen. Yeah. It's so sad, you know, and to see her go and it will be look so different. It's just amazing. She, she was such an amazing woman. She, she did so much. It is still just two days since the queen died and the emotion was clear as family members comforted one another. Taking time to read some of the hundreds of messages left at the castle gates in tribute to their mother and grandmother. Before returning back behind castle walls, they stopped and looked back. Prince Andrew, in a rare public appearance, led a wave, which was acknowledged by the crowd. A mutual recognition of the loss the family and the nation is coming to terms with. Sarah Campbell, BBC News, Balmoral. While well, the Queen travelled widely across the UK throughout her long reign, and it's thought that nearly a third of the country saw or even met her during her lifetime. One of the places she visited a number of times was Bolton in Lancashire, and our special correspondent Jeremy Cook has been to the town to speak to people who met and admired her. Away from the capital and the palace and the crowds. A nation's quiet grief. Quiet, but profoundly felt. She's beautiful. There'll never be another one like her, will there? I mean, tears just streamed down my face and... Uh, you've got to believe it, but it's difficult, isn't it? Yeah. There's sadness here, of course. But gratitude too, so many lives touched by their queen. Telegrams and cards that mean so much. I got one, a special one for my diamond wedding. It's nice with that book, yeah. Buckingham Palace um, envelope. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we treasure that, we treasure that. Her Majesty the Queen and the Duke of Edinburgh leave Bolton Town Hall. Bolton, in our northern heartlands, a royal destination over several decades. In 2009, it was Warburton's Bakery. A short visit, but lifelong memories. She made me feel exceedingly important, and that's what I remember about her. She's all about me on that day. Would it be ridiculous of me to say that that moment, that exchange, actually changed your life? It did, yes, because I'm, I'm still talking about it 13 years later. And, you know, I've, I've met the Queen, um, and I remember when she walked away and she turned back to me, she said, keep up the good work. And I said to my colleague at the side, I said, wow. The passing of a monarch is a loss felt in all corners of the country. In offering our deepest condolences and sympathies 
in passing of our late Queen Elizabeth II. In every one of our communities. She is not just a queen, she was our queen, queen for all communities, whichever faith you were from. Uh, in particular, I'd like to sort of pass my condolences from the community of Makamos and the community as a whole. <clears throat> she was our queen and we deeply, deeply want to miss her. Al, the bus driver, is a proud monarchist. Good to see you. His patriotic outfit, a heartfelt tribute. I think the whole world is going to miss her. Really, the whole world is going to miss They are. Um, what can we do? We can, we can move on and, as I say, support our new king. Take a moment, though. Karen is all about helping and supporting Bolton's younger generation. She knows the inspiration that the Queen has given, especially on her visits to this town. It makes the community feel like they matter, um, as individuals, as a community, as a town, that, you know, we're not just a place forgotten up in the north uh, when, when the Queen comes to see us, so really, really important. Last word to Tilly, a personal tribute across the generations. Thank you for looking after the country and caring. Hope that you rest in peace. Jeremy Cook, BBC News, Bolton. Now in other news. After months of virtual deadlock, Russian forces have withdrawn from key eastern towns as a Ukrainian counterattack makes further gains. Ukrainian officials said that troops entered Kupiansk, a vital supply hub for Russian forces. In some areas, the Russian retreat is said to have been a rout, and the Russians have pulled out from around Izium. Moscow says to regroup elsewhere. From central Ukraine, our senior international correspondent Oligirin reports. Ukraine's rapid counter-offensive is gaining ground. Its troops taking some casualties, but also taking territory on several fronts. Catching Russian forces off guard, even surprising some Ukrainians. This footage was filmed by the troops. We can't document the battles ourselves. For now, journalists have been banned from the front lines. Kyiv determined to win the information war. As it's reclaiming territory, tearing the occupation to shreds in the eastern city of Kupiansk. In some areas, Russia's front line has collapsed. And liberation has come. Everything is okay, troops tell locals in the town of Balaklia. For six months we prayed you would come, she says. <laughs> Natalia, too, endured months under occupation by the Russians, who she calls fascists. She and her husband Volodymyr were freed by the counter-offensive, but still show signs of their trauma. When you saw the Ukrainian soldiers, when you realized they had come to free you, what was that moment like? What were your feelings? We thought we would never see them. And then our boys came. And they were so handsome, so beautiful, especially compared to the fascists. I didn't know what to do with them, if I should hug them or hold their hands. I touched them and I was very happy. Ukrainian social media has been flooded with patriotic videos. The national anthem, now a battle hymn for troops, who believe that momentum is swinging their way. But the Russians still hold around a fifth of Ukraine including the city of Kherson. This was the resistance on the streets back in March. It was the first major Ukrainian city to fall 
after the invasion. We managed to reach a woman still living there who says the Russians are starting to lie low. For her protection, we aren't naming her and her words are spoken by a BBC producer. Over the past two or three days, the military seem to have quietened down a bit. They are less visible in cafes and restaurants. If street fighting starts, it will be very dangerous. But I will sit in the basement for days or weeks, if needs be. I want to see our army here and thank them. I want to see their victory. Scenes like this are cathartic for Ukraine and reassuring for its Western backers. Few would imagine a swift end to the war. But the Ukrainians have now shown they can beat the Russians in battle, not just outmaneuver them. And Orla joins us now from the city of Kreverik in central Ukraine. And Orla, how significant are the Ukrainian advances? Well, I think many here will feel this was a momentous day. One Ukrainian colleague has just said, I'm shocked, pleasantly shocked by the advances that have been made, although he also said that he was cautious about what might follow. There's no doubt this has been a huge boost to morale here. I was here before the invasion began on the day when it started, and I've been back since. And during my last visit in June, the Russians were grinding forward, taking territory slowly. There was really no sense then that the Ukrainians might be able to mount a kind of a strong counterattack. Now, what seems to have made the difference is the arrival of the long range, multiple rocket launch systems that Kyiv had been asking for from Britain and the United States and the arrival of other sophisticated weapon systems from NATO allies. And make no mistake, the losses today for the Russians are extremely significant. They are strategic losses to cities that were transportation hubs, logistical centers for Russian troops here. Now, Moscow has tried to dress it up by saying that these troops were withdrawn and will regroup elsewhere, but I think that's not very persuasive. Clearly, the Ukrainians are now on the front foot and they will be trying to press their advantage as far as they can. And Orla, given where we are in this conflict, what is likely to happen next? Well, President Putin won't be throwing in the towel. He has been obsessed with Ukraine for years. He seems to see the capture of Ukraine as a multi-year project. He has already talked about mounting his own new offensive, which is unlikely to happen before, next, before the winter is over and next spring comes. I think for now he may have to focus on trying to minimise his losses. He hasn't just suffered military setbacks today. It's a public humiliation. And something very important has shifted. What we have seen here for the first time, really, is that Ukrainian forces are able to take the battle to the Russians and beat them in battle, not just outmaneuver them and outsmart them. That's something we hadn't seen previously. The Russians had actually pulled back from around Kiev. This time, Ukraine took the fight to them. And according to one British military expert I spoke to today, this is the first time since the Second World War that entire Russian military units have been lost. Orla, many thanks. Orla Girin reporting there. Let's take a look now at some of the other stories making the news today. Hundreds of people gathered outside the headquarters of the Metropolitan Police to protest against the shooting dead of a 24-year-old black man in South London on Monday. Chris Caber was killed by a police officer following a car chase. His family are demanding the officer involved be immediately suspended after the police watchdog declared a murder investigation. The Met Police says the officer is not on operational duties and the force is cooperating fully with the police watchdog. The UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres has said that Pakistan needs massive financial support following devastating floods that have marooned vast parts of the country. On the second day of his visit to Pakistan, he described the situation as unimaginable. More than 1,400 people have died and millions have been forced to flee their homes. And UK scientists have established how air pollution can lead to cancer, a discovery that they say will transform our understanding of how tumours develop. 
The findings presented to the European Society for Medical Oncology could lead to drugs that block the disease. Let's go back now to our main story and the official proclamation of Charles as King took place not just in London today but also in Ottawa in Canada where he replaces the Queen as Head of State. Queen Elizabeth made no fewer than 22 state visits there during her reign, more than to any other country. Our chief international correspondent Lise Doucette reports now on how her fellow Canadians are remembering the Queen. <laughs> bare skin hats and a bugle. This morning in Ottawa, a solemn ceremony to confirm a king. His Royal Highness Prince Charles Philip Arthur George is now, by the death of our late sovereign, Charles III. A new head of state, Canada one of 14 Commonwealth countries, former colonies, which still keep the crown. Queen Elizabeth II was at its helm for nearly half of its history. We thought she'd always be here. Yeah, yeah. And we'll miss her, we'll miss her humor, we'll miss her brains. She's had a calming effect on, on so many people over tough times, tumultuous times. Thank you again for your welcome. It is very good to be home. For seven decades, she drew the crowds here old and new generations gathering to greet her, displaying affection for her and for what she loved. From corgi fan clubs in the capital, Ottawa, to fast horses at the Calgary Stampede in the West, Prince Philip enjoying himself too, always at her side, embracing Canadian culture, including its national sport. I think it's absolutely wonderful. She's really touched the spirit of what being a Canadian is all about. But often, the Queen was on thin ice. Seldom before, if ever, has Her Majesty been so heavily guarded as on this drive to the Parliament buildings. Sometimes the people who showed up came to protest. This was the scene in the mainly French-speaking province of Quebec in 1964, when separatist sentiment was at its highest anger over English domination. The Queen knew it, never showed it, steering a middle course. Ottawa is a small capital. From her very first visit as Queen in 1957, she always spoke both of Canada's official languages. Better than even some of Canada's politicians. Another difficult legacy of a darker imperial past. The Indians were so delighted to meet the great white queen. For Canada's indigenous community, the monarchy also symbolizes dispossession, discrimination, horrific abuses Canada's leaders are still confronting. This morning's ceremony to welcome the king sends another signal. The monarch's representative, Governor General Mary Simon, is the first indigenous person to hold this role. Other change could be coming. The monarchy is changing, so too is Canada. The Queen was able to move with the times to remain relevant. Now more and more Canadians are saying the monarchy no longer matters. But this is a country where the constitution is hard to change. So for now, it's a country with a king. Leads to set BBC News, Ottawa. Here, yeah, football grounds and race courses around the country stayed empty this afternoon after their governing bodies decided to postpone events to mark the death of Queen Elizabeth. But after the government signalled that individual sporting organisations should make their own decisions, some sport is going ahead. Our sports correspondent Joe Wilson reports. No one at the Oval needed to be told. As the cricketers of England and South Africa readied themselves, there was a hush in the grandstands long before the announcer officially declared a minute of silence would begin. And then came the reflection. And then came God Save the King.
That was the unique context before the cricket. England bowled out South Africa for just 118 and then closed on 154 for seven in reply. Remarkable numbers, but the day will be remembered for far more. It felt right to be here, actually. It felt like sport can bring people together in, in tough times and, and show respect and actually celebrate the Queen's life. And, you know, she, she, she loved her sport. It felt great walking onto the field, wearing the, the badge with the crown on together as a group. It, it, it felt like the right thing to do. And I think every player was delighted when the game was uh, decided that it would continue. In the evening in Durham, England's women's cricketers played their T20 international against India. In golf, the PGA Championship at Wentworth resumed today. Rugby in both codes in England also chose to play. The competitors paid their respects and spectators shared private emotions in these public settings. Football authorities across England, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland decided that matches should not take place this weekend. Horse racing, Queen Elizabeth's great passion also paused to resume to express its thanks tomorrow. When the Great North Run, with some 60,000 raising millions for charity, will also take place as scheduled. Our mission is to organise the event in such a way that it pays true respect to the Queen's life and also allows people to express their own feelings and their own tribute to our great Queen. To the Queen. Queen Elizabeth marked and elevated some of the proudest sporting moments. As the winners changed, she was a constant. And as her involvement in horse racing displayed, sport was her source of joy, as it is for so many. Joe Wilson, BBC News. Well, we can speak now to our home editor, Mark Easton, who is at Buckingham Palace for us now. And Mark, uh, just looking back at the events of the day, what was it that struck you most? Well, Rita, as you will know, there is a huge media village that has sprung up opposite Buckingham Palace. Uh, and the world is here and the world is watching. And what the world saw today was the formal handover of power in the United Kingdom, uh, dressed in breeches and braid and wearing a surprising hat. The language at times may have seemed archaic. The ceremony at times may have seemed mystifying. But King Charles, just like his mother, understands that, uh, that convention and custom drape over the, the, the moment, the potentially destabilizing process that we are in, and can actually bring a, a resilience uh, to, to that process. Uh, and actually, I think that for the king, for King Charles, uh, it is going to be one of the big questions of his reign. Uh, what is the balance in the 21st century between the ancient and the modern? And the world's press saw both today. They saw the formality of those royal proclamations and royal audiences, but they also saw the informality of a king and his queen driving out of the palace, going up the mall, hopping out of the car, and going and shaking hands in the most relaxed way. So we have seen today, the world's press has seen today, uh, tradition and modernity side by side. So, Mark, given what you're saying, do you sense that the king is trying to judge and respond to the mood of the nation? I think that's absolutely right, and not just him. We have, of course, a new monarch and a new prime minister who have, between them, less than a week's experience in those roles. They are both newbies. Uh, they're both having to learn the job very fast. Uh, and I think that what they'll both be wanting to do is find ways to demonstrate to the country that they are on top of the job. And we were reporting earlier about that that UK tour that the, the King and his Queen and Liz Truss, the Prime Minister, will be making next week, uh, and as well as uh, many of the services that, uh, the, that the King will be going to and the, and the process of, of, uh, of allowing people to pay their respects across the country, I think it's also an opportunity to reassure the public that, uh, that both he and his Prime Minister are on the job and can see Britain through the challenges that quite clearly lie ahead. Mark, many thanks. Our home editor, Mark Easton, there. Time now for a look at the weather. Here's Ben Rich. Ben.
Hi there, Rita. Thank you. Good evening. After the frequent heavy downpours we've had to contend with for much of this week, today has been a quieter day. There have been one or two showers, but most of us have been dry. A window of fine weather. But on the satellite picture, we can see areas of cloud pushing in from the west, and they will eventually close that window of fine weather for some of us during the day tomorrow. For most, we start on a fine note, but there will be some areas of fog first thing, some of which could be fairly dense. It should tend to lift and clear. And then for most of us, we are going to see spells of sunshine. It'll feel quite warm in that sunshine. However, a bit of rain grazing the west of Cornwall, the west of Wales, and some heavy rain starting to arrive in Northern Ireland later on. But with a southerly breeze, it will feel warm. Sheltered spots on the northeast coast of Scotland, 21 degrees. Parts of southeast England up to 24. But a really wet end of the day tomorrow across Northern Ireland. Heavy thundery rain then sweeping northeastwards across Scotland overnight. Band of rain developing across parts of Northern England into North Wales. In fact, a few different bands of rain on Monday. It's quite a messy story, but they will generally be across this central part of the UK and will act as a dividing line. To the northwest, we see a northwesterly wind and some rather cool weather. 17 there for Glasgow. Towards the southeast, some real warmth up to around 26 degrees. But through Monday night into Tuesday, a frontal system sweeps that warmth away. And then we are going to see high pressure building its way in from the west later in the week. Now that will leave us with this uh, north or northwest of the airflow. And actually, we're going to tap into some really rather cool air. So if we have a look at the temperatures for the week ahead, after a warm start for some, those temperatures will drop away quite significantly. In fact, I suspect by the end of the coming week, it is going to start to feel quite different. That's all from me. Rita, back to ben, you. Thank you. And that is all from us on the BBC News at 10. Tomorrow there will be full coverage of the journey of the Queen's Cortege from Balmoral to Edinburgh on BBC One at 10am. But before we go, we'll leave you with some memorable images from an extraordinary day. Good night. I, Charles III, by the grace of God of the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. God save the King. God save the King. Cheers for His Majesty the King. Hip hip! Hooray! Hip hip! Hooray!